Uh, what an incredible crowd we have today. So I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, I just heard a report from the parking lot. There's gridlock out there. So uh, that's why we just gave it a few more minutes to let people come into the room. But we have a sold out crowd today and uh, it's, it's so exciting to be here. My name is Gary Gaston. I'm the executive director of the Nashville Civic Design Center. And on behalf of our staff and our board of directors, uh, I just want to uh, extend a uh, welcome to you all. I know we also have several council members with us here today and also uh, a lot of representatives from various different metro governments and departments offices. So thank you all for attending as well. Um, I wanna give a big thank you to the Frist Center for the Visual Arts for hosting us today. Uh, this space is beautiful. It's a beautiful space and uh, the first staff has been a wonderful partner in working with us on this event and also several other events we've had in the recent past and we look forward to, to many more opportunities in the future. Uh, if you have not had a chance to visit Bellissima, the Italian automotive Re renaissance, 1945 to 1975, it closes on Sunday. So do not let this opportunity pass without seeing that. Um, for those of you who might not be familiar with the Nashville Civic Design Center, we are a nonprofit organization dedicated to uh, improving the quality of Nashville's built environment and promoting public participation in the design conversation to create a better city for everybody. And uh, much of our work over the past five years has been uh, in the creation of this publication, Shaping the Healthy Community, which uh, I get to give a plug. It's for sale in the bookshop, in the gift shop just outside. Uh, but this process looked at how we could create a healthier city through design. And uh, we have come through our work to deeply understand the value and importance that beautiful parks and open spaces bring to our city. These are places where public life has a chance to thrive like never before. So uh, again, the importance of, of this conversation about design and park space is more relevant than ever. Uh, and if you happen to be downtown in the last few weeks, you might have attended our parking day event where we turned over 70 on-street parking spaces into parklets for the day. And uh, it was an incredible experience and it's had a huge impact, I think, on evolving the conversation about streets in the city and how we as uh, pedestrians and citizens can start to reclaim more spaces for pedestrians and uh, whenever possible try to whittle out a little bit more space from the automobile. So, um, and I'm very excited also to let you all know that uh, the Civic Design Center is engaged very closely with the Metro Public Works and with Gell's Studios, which is an international design firm, to start the conversation about the, uh, looking at future design of Lower Broadway. So uh, this will be a public engagement process which kicked off officially uh, last week and will be taking place over the next six months. So uh, stay tuned to that. There's gonna be a lot of opportunity for involvement from the community. Uh, just if you wanna learn more about us and what we're doing and how to get engaged, please visit our website at civicdesigncenter.org. Uh, so today's lecture entitled The Contemporary Urban Parks of NBW, a family album of our cities, is a part of the Future of Parks lecture series, which is a partnership between the Nashville Civic Design Center and the uh, Metro P Parks. Uh, there are two more events in this series, and there's a flyer. And when you checked in, you should have gotten this, but if you don't have one, please pick it up on the way out. Uh, our next event is going to be on October the 18th at the Civic Design Center, where Metro Parks Assistant Director Tim Nate will present initial findings of the plan to play, master plan. And in December, Peter Harnick, who is the director of the Trust for Public Land, will be here uh, as a keynote speaker. It's very clear to me from your attendance today that the future of parks is important to you and the Civic Design Center joins you in this enthusiasm, passion and care that you have and that we all have for parks in our city. Uh, before I turn this over to Tim, who's gonna introduce Thomas, I just have to say, uh, I've had a chance to get to know Thomas Woltz over the last few months during his visits here to Nashville. And uh, we're very lucky to have such a passionate, talented designer who uh, deeply loves Nashville and uh, I had the chance to uh, accompany him. Last night we went to the Centennial Park for the Nashville Scenes Best of Nashville. And uh, to be able to sit in the new space that just opened and look up at the Parthenon and discuss the design features and the history of the site 
and the future of its uh, design was a very special experience. So I'm very much looking forward to the talk today. So, Tim. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. I'm Tim Nach with Metro Parks, and um, thank you all so much for coming here today. I think you're really going to enjoy Thomas's talk. Um, on behalf of Metro Parks, I also want to thank the Nashville Civic Design Center. They've been an incredible partner on this uh, process, and we're very lucky to have them in Nashville helping to uh, influence uh, the future of the built environment here. I also want to acknowledge our co-sponsors for today's event, uh, the Nashville Parks Foundation, the Trust for Public Land, uh, the Tennessee ASLA, the Conservancy for Centennial Park and the Parthenon, and there's one more. Rebecca, where are you? <laughs> I th we've got one more sponsor. It should be on the bottom of the, of the sheet that has been handed out to you. <laughs> Cumberland River Compact, there we go. Um, um, this speaker series is a part of Plan to Play, which is the countywide parks and greenways master planning process that the Parks Department is uh, currently working on. We started the process in January. We're about two-thirds of the way through that process. Um, thanks to all of you who have participated in, in this project so far, and I want to make sure that you're all aware of the next round of public meetings, four meetings that will happen uh, next week. And uh, again, there's a flyer out front that gives the locations and times for those meetings. It's very important that all of you participate in that process. So we, we hope to see you then. Plan to Play is, is really going to be uh, the city's guidebook for the future of our parks and greenways system over the next 10 years. So it's, it's critically important. Um, so we hope to see you next month, or next week rather, uh, at those meetings. Centennial Park and Thomas Waltz. I have to tell you that uh, this has been one of the most rewarding projects of my career. We're thrilled to have been able to bring uh, Thomas to Nashville and work on um, Nashville's most uh, significant historic, cultural, uh, and signature park. Um, other key partners in this process have been uh, Tara Armistead, who is a member of the Nashville Civic Design Center board and a Nashville treasurer, and she has uh, been involved uh, in so many different roles in Centennial Park for a long time. So we're, we're grateful for her uh, involvement in the process, and also Hodgson and Douglas, local landscape architects. Um, there's a lot that I could uh, share about Thomas, but I think the main thing that I want uh, the main thing that I want to, sh to let you all know is just how deeply invested he is in Nashville, and I think that that will become very clear to you when he talks about his uh, design process and his his knowledge of what's happening in this city. Uh, so, with that, please join me in welcoming Thomas Waltz. Thank you so much uh, for those introductions and for this opportunity. Um, to all the people that have been thanked, I want to, to, to add my gratitude. Um, it's rare to be in a city where you didn't grow up and have a room of 250 people, and I think I know half of you. Um, it's incredible. It feels like a family, a kind of homecoming. And I think anybody who knows me well of this group knows that I like, I like my job. I like my job a lot. And I like it because, in many cases, it's defending what may be part of the last democratic realm of our nation, which are our public landscapes. And I like it because I get to do that arm in arm with some of the most remarkable people in our country. That starts with my own staff. If Elisa Diamond, I've never done this before, but if Elisa and Chloe and Jen could stand up, and then, thank you. And if you'll stay standing for a second, you can hold applause, but I'd love for the Hodgson Douglas team to stand up. I'd love for Tara and Tim, Metro Parks staff, Conservancy staff, Conservancy board. This is what it, this is, please, all of you stand up. The, um, um, I want, uh, the staff from the parks, anyone on the park? Yes.
I only do that to demonstrate that I get to talk about it, but all of us are doing it. All of us are doing it arm in arm. And my fantasy would be if this park takes a decade to complete, that if we do this again and we say, who in this room has been involved in sustaining and building Centennial Park that every single person would stand up. That's my dream. These landscapes happen, they're the public realm, but they happen now more and more in our nation because of private support, private philanthropy, private care, maintenance, conservancies that have sprung up across the nation. We have to all lean in and help. So hopefully a few years from now, we'll all stand up. Um, today I'm gonna to walk you through three parks. Um, and what I would like to demonstrate is the methodology with which we approach the public landscape. Each of these is a public-private partnership, to my point about the sort of reality that we face in the United States. Um, one of them is in Texas, one of them in Nashville, and one of them in New York City. They don't look alike, they don't act alike. They're very different scales, from 28 acres to 120 acres to 1,000 500 acres. They're all urban. Every single one of them has the opportunity to tell us stories about the place that they exist. I had the opportunity, uh, Gary mentioned we went to Best of Nashville last night and I was sort of laughing to myself thinking, I had the opportunity to meet an extraordinary woman in Nashville um, and present the park to her. Her name is Jana Davis and she works at HCA. And at the end of about an hour of walking her through everything we had done for the, for the design of Centennial Park, she looked up and she said, you know, what you've given us in addition to a, a plan for our park is you've actually given us the family album of our city. You've told us who we are as Nashvillians and why this place is important. I tried to be manly and <clears throat> clear my throat a little bit. <laughs> I was like, it didn't do so well. Um, I, I just was so touched by that observation. And so I asked her, I was here a month ago, and I asked her, I said, Jonna, can I use that as the title of my talk? Because a family album of our cities, I think is a really accurate portrayal of what our public landscapes can be. So I'm gonna take you on a, on a brief journey uh, through three projects with a methodology um, that I wanna demonstrate uh, through each one. In essence, what you'll recognize is that Nelson Bird Waltz tries to unpack the ecological history and framework of a piece of land concurrently to the cultural forces that shape that piece of land. So when you create basically a portrait of the ecology and a portrait of the culture through deep research, by the time you finish that and you add in the program of what's needed for that park, you have a whole vocabulary of parts and pieces that only belong to that landscape. That's where you capture the portrait of a place. Now, why do all this? Well, at the end of the talk, I think, I hope, you'll see why, and I'll touch on that at the end. Our firm is um, in two offices, one in New York City, one in Charlottesville, Virginia. Uh, this summer, counting interns, we were 45 people uh, between the two offices, and we did this book with Princeton Architectural Press a couple of years ago, and we named it this crazy title because we wanted to demonstrate the breadth at which the profession of landscape architecture could be practiced. So you have the garden, the park, community is the word we use for town planning and campus planning, and then farm is an unusual uh, piece of our portfolio uh, that is we call the conservation agriculture studio, where we bring a little bit the ideas I mentioned about public landscapes, but looking at the farmed landscape. We're currently dealing with about 80,000 acres of sustainable agriculture in New Zealand, Australia, and the United States. So that's just a quick portrait. Today I'm only speaking about uh, parks. I like to start with this slide because this is the side of the mountains that I grew up on. Y'all are just on the other side of those. So I was born on the same latitude as Nashville and uh, looked out to these mountains, uh, as, as the song says, from whence cometh my help. Um, and uh, it reminds me of the Wendell Berry quote that I, I love to mention to people, that you don't know who you are until you know where you are. And our work at Centennial Park is trying to tell people where they are in the city, in the nation, and within the flow of the cultural evolution of America. Um, briefly, some of the things that are on the boards and active right now, um, Georgia 400, a park over in Buckhead, uh, Under Armour's global headquarters in Baltimore Harbor, um, 
a, a very large urban park in downtown Auckland, New Zealand, um, a sustainable agriculture school uh, called the Fuller Center for Productive Landscapes. Uh, this was an Olmsted designed landscape. The, for the Aga Khan, a, uh, a gift to the nation of Canada as a Devonian botanic garden at the top, and the Flight 93 mem Memorial uh, to the tragedy of September 11th in Pennsylvania. Um, a community college campus, I think the future of education in so many ways with industrialization leaving America, community colleges, we must invest in them. And so this, doing this as a pro bono project for how could you create a beautiful campus for a community college is exciting work. The King's Cross development in London um, and a 6,000 acre property in Tasmania, New Zealand to be a model for sustainable agriculture, excuse, Tasmania, Australia, to be a model for sustainable agriculture for Australia. So now to the three parks. I'm going to take you from uh, Houston to New York to Nashville. Actually, f I actually fly that in a week on many occasions, <laughs> I just realized. Um, Tim had mentioned the Parkswide Master Plan, and I've been following that with great interest. It's so wise, so wise to invest in that kind of planning, and my hat is off to, to the decision makers who are leading that effort. Um, it made me think to uh, show this park in Houston. Um, our park is right here. Uh, Memorial Park uh, that we're working on. But this is a plan by Arthur Comey uh, that was done at the beginning of the, 19th, of the 20th century where he looked at all the bios uh, of Houston and the potential for where strategic locations for parks and he proposed an entire parks network that would connect the whole region of Houston just as your parks master plan is looking ahead to the future. This is where we all get involved again Sadly, in Houston, all of it was developed, right up to the edge of the rivers, right up to the edge, almost all of it. A few of the parks remain. Fortunately, Memorial Park remains and has been protected. And so now they're down to the drainage ways, the power line easements, and they're making the best they can with it. These are the bayous that uh, are now part, that's the park I'm gonna show you. This is the shipping channel. So this is, this is Greater Houston. And now they're looking at a network, uh, a law was passed to use underneath the power lines. It's what they're down to, but they're making the most of it. And it's quite innovative to create this green grid for cycling and hiking and biking, uh, biking and cycling, I said that, um, uh, throughout the city. So when you start to look at it in a different way, it becomes a remarkable, uh, a remarkable network. So this is Memorial Park. I'm going to fly through uh, three years of work on the park. Uh, we are. Uh, just in clearing and breaking ground on the first phase of this park. But I'm showing you this overlay of the Greensward plan of Central Park at scale to show you that it's twice the size of Central Park in New York City. So imagine designing that from zero, really from starting over. Now why is it zero? This park is 100 years old. Um, this is what it looked like before 2010. It was a place with many layers of history. Most Houstonians claimed it was the last surviving piece of the great thicket, that it was a primeval forest untouched, and we showed up and we're like, wait a minute. <laughs> These are all invasive plants from China. I don't know how you think this is. <clears throat> but convincing Texans of something they don't want to be convinced of is a tricky business, but we've been hard at work doing it. But, but this is why, you see they're like carved out holes, you know, wherever they needed a ball field, they cleared an area, put a parking lot, put up some lights. And so it's suffered from plop and drop that a lot of American parks have suffered from, but it suffered particularly. Now, it suffered from an absolute ecological tragedy. For six years, it basically did not rain in Houston. And that unhealthy, untended forest turned into that. 80% of the tree canopy was dead. So we began a process of digging in. We were hired uh, to work one year of public process through a master planning uh, effort and then one year of design. And now we've been, I guess, a year and a half in developing those designs, fundraising, and uh, starting for the, working toward the first phase implementation. So in understanding the park, we realized like so many landscapes, and again, this is why we have to stand up for this uh, countywide parks master plan, be the stewards of it, to protect it. 
because unfortunately, even though there are strong covenants protecting this park, I-610, I mean, it's only 18 lanes of highway. I mean, that's a big old Texas highway. And then you have a 16 lane highway to the north, got dumped inside the park. This land got sold, uh, 68 acres got sold for 12 on the river that you can't build on. So some strange things happen. And then a six lane highway got put through the middle of the park with uh, feeder roads here and then a big loop and a golf course. So the park was actually chopped into about 24 uh, segments. And so he said, well, one of the goals of the master plan will be to reunite land, move roads to the perimeter, reunite large tracts of land so that you feel like you're in a park, not in a subdivision. But then we also wanted to tell the stories of the land. We had to hear them first. We had to see them. Much of them were gone. Um, I think our nation has a tremendous amount of work to do in the realm of first peoples, the Native American people of this country, the African American story, the slavery story. We do not tell these stories honestly, and we don't tell them frequently. And I think the landscape is an extraordinary place where the truth of these stories can start to be revealed. There's a lot of work to be done. Um, we found uh, this map of the languages, the linguistic patterns of the Native American occupation. This is Houston, right in here on the Gulf of Mexico. And it was understood that the Karankawa Indians had been managing this landscape, this pristine forest, for hundreds of years before European settlement. Um, uh, John Jacobs was the soil scientist on our team. Uh, he discovered deep in the soil and regular intervals of ash, revealing that this was a, a prairie landscape managed by fire by the Native American Indian tribes. So just that, you know, alone, starting to tell people of the, for hundreds of years, if not thousands, people have been occupying this land. We then took away all the, all the drop, plop and drop, and started to look at the patterns of soils, the types of soils. Let's listen to what the land tells us it needs to be, because here's the big deal. Drought will hit Houston again. Floods will hit Houston again. If we're going to spend $300 million on a park, let's invest in the most resilient native ecologies that will not 100% survive, but they have a much better chance of surviving than highly irrigated non-native ecologies that didn't ever belong there. So, um, so that's what we did, and the soils are our first clue. In most of our projects, we start with a team of conservation biologists, and we do what we call a bio blitz, where we gather information and data about the ecological networks of the site. So in this case, we had probably 40 scientists uh, on the project. And that yielded this map, where we realized we had riparian forest, we had a pine hardwood forest, and then a pine hardwood savanna, a post oak savanna, a dry prairie, and a wet prairie. So let's think about restoring these large-scale ecologies and then fit the program for the park within that. So it's really listening to the site and going back to what its primeval state would have been. This is, by the way, the Wilderness Park. This is, there's a very European-style park, Herman Park in Houston, that's a very different feel. This needs to remain the Wilderness Park. Um, you know, if you like soccer, you think there should be 50 soccer fields in there. If you like birds, you think nobody should be in there. If you, you know, and so we met with 3,300 Houstonians through this process, all of whom had opinions. Um, <clears throat> so this is the master plan that we delivered a year and a half ago, and you'll see this highway got moved to the perimeter of the park to reunite a couple hundred acres for equestrian trails, uh, a speed biking trail. Um, this is where we discovered artifacts of uh, a very important chapter of the history of the park, thanks to the archaeologists on our team. There were the ruins of the training camp for one, World War I soldiers uh, that was called Camp Logan. So after the Native Americans were, well, made ill by smallpox, and the Western European settlers came and did agriculture and grazing on this site. It was actually a deed to the Reinerman family. They had uh, fruit orchards, uh, did grazing of livestock. It later became a timber operation. So it was cleared repeatedly um, as all the trees were cut down for timber. So again, this pristine forest thing was making me crazy. Um, and uh, then I'm a hog whose father had discovered this little old thing called oil at Spindletop. Um, she bought it 
And she had more money than the city of Houston, so she went to the city of Houston and she said, look, I'll sell it back to you at a fixed rate over the coming years, but I want this to become a park in memorial to the soldiers trained in Camp Logan. And so that was the, the training camp. Thousands of the people trained in that camp died in service to our freedom in the European uh, uh, conflict. So uh, the city made good on that arrangement. She wanted hair and hair to design the master plan for the park. The Great Depression happened, World War II happened, and it grew up as an exotic forest and has remained untended for 100 years. So that's the layered history of this place. So much to know. So uh, these remnants of Camp Logan were more prevalent in this area of the park. So we thought, we need to tell the public why it's Memorial Park. No one knew, uh, very few people. And then move the playing fields up next to I-10 so they could share mowing equipment, maintenance equipment, irrigation, concessions, parking, all of those things. So we've distributed parking here, 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 and here. So that now you go to close to the amenity you want to use instead of having a massive parking lot. But what that did was it liberated the entire southern half of the park to be a wildlife sanctuary of nearly a thousand acres in the heart of Houston, right between downtown and uptown Houston, along the only river in Houston that's not in a concrete channel. Then a children's wild play area, a series of boardwalks and mountain bike trails, and then what we call the Southern Arc. It's a one mile long boardwalk that someone in a wheelchair can take. It's absolutely level, and you can get to these 30 foot high bluffs over the Buffalo Bayou River. You can be in the tops of the trees, and you may not be able to walk, but you can have this wilderness experience because this one mile is absolutely level all the way through the park. And then uh, the Glades, which is the first project going under construction, that's a sort of uh, a big lawn with high canopy for shade, for picnicking and family outings. And then working, looking at the overall civil engineering, we are proposing five lakes that will catch stormwater to uh, irrigate the park. Currently, this golf course drinks 68 million gallons of treated drinking water annually. So we can offset that by pumping water from I-10 into these lakes and catching uh, the rainfall in the park. So you know, it's, landscape architecture is not decorating the outdoors. It's thinking in giant scale systems of civil engineering, of culture, history, and ecology. So then, uh, so that gets us all the way around. So I'm gonna take you just on a brief tour. We'll put the top down, ride with me, chill out, have a beer. Um, this is looking to downtown Houston. This is our friend, the 16 lane juggernaut, um, soccer fields, treed parking lots, uh, an expanded driving range, you know, all the things needed for a world-class um, park. To re-stitch parts of the park, we had a fairly audacious idea. Let's look at wildlife crossing technology that's fairly affordable tunnels of pre-cast concrete, backfilled with soil so you could actually plant big trees and we could link the prairie, the restored prairie, over, over the highway. So this was our concept. Now the engineering of it is more complicated because it's sandy soils, the thing might sink, so we have to do piloti. There's all that real stuff that happens after the concept. <laughs> but this is the plan of these two land bridges going over Memorial Parkway. And this is the rendering of what that might look like. So the prairie lifts up and over, and it comes with a free hot air balloon. Um, <laughs> our renderer wanted to put this in, this amazing company called Mir in Scandinavia, and I was like, oh, guys, really, the balloon? And they were like, no, 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 people will love it. They were right. <laughs> they were so right. And I was like, but nobody sees that one. It's like, yeah. Anyway, uh, this is the new running trail center. And again, we didn't want it to feel like a high school campus, so this is Houston. This is wet, humid. It's in the middle of a wet prairie. And so this rendering starts to evoke the quality of an early morning run in Houston. So our job is to amplify the qualities of a place, embrace those qualities of the place, and, um, and entice people to, to the pleasure of parks. This is the Southern Arc, and you can see the design mountain biking and hiking trails, and this is that boardwalk. Follow my, if you can see the red dot, I'm gonna take you from the, the uh, Eastern Bluff Overlook through the riparian forest, the Barranca, which is a, a ravine, 
to uh, wet prairie, dry prairie, back through wet prairie, through riparian forest, excuse me, through the post oak savanna here, and all the way back to the riparian forest with the overlook there. And then a tower that lets you look back to the city. In a way, your body can now measure all the actually interesting topography from a city that thinks it's flat. Um, this is the different qualities of running through the dry prairie, uh, the, uh, the pine and hardwood forest, and the bike trails uh, through the forest. Hare and Hare had done a concept plan for this park. None of it was built. And we thought, well, that's actually an interesting layer of the history. And we looked at this is all that they, they did, and we found this one sort of geometric area, this circular area that says garden. The idea had been to build a, a conservatory there. And we thought, this is a wilderness park. A conservatories consume enormous amounts of energy, and they showcase South African tropicals. Like, is that really what we need in the wilderness park of Nashville? But we, we were interested in this gesture and the axial relationship to other parts of the park. So we riffed on that and in that same location and came up with this large elliptical lawn that we're calling the Glade. We also happened to discover that this was the original entrance to Camp Logan, the World War I training camp. So here we're on the axis, and we can revive that as part of the park. So here's the Camp Logan entrance, parking, the glade, and then a constructed lake that will hold stormwater to irrigate the golf course. And that is uh, a rendering. It is not built, but this is what is about to break ground. So this is the large elliptical lawn with two pavilions overlooking um, what becomes a very rich um, biological um, uh, attribute for the park. So the last piece of uh, memorial that I'm going to tell you as we move, make our way to New York is the memorial groves. Um, several of you may walk out um, as I tell you the story. You might really hate me uh, after this, but I'm going to stand by it. I think it's an important idea. It's not an easy idea. So this is like the warning, like hide your children right, right about now. Um, so these are some images from the World War I training camp. You know, war... I just, I, my parents were, my dad was in training when World War II ended. They were born in the Depression. The identity of war in their lives was such a presence. And only because I had very old parents am I really that aware of it. But I think for younger kids today, they have no idea what it meant to know everyone from your college class died. I mean, that's, that, the, that, that's such an impactful idea of sacrifice and loss. So, this is uh, an image that we found. Uh, Susan Turner was our um, cultural landscape historian on this project and helped us with a great deal of things, but also we have um, Secret Weapon and Elisa Diamond, who's a great uh, uh, historian within our office, and uh, found images of you know, the pines that are amongst the tents, and we were able to recreate, thanks to original plans of Camp Logan, where these, and align them with the remnants we were finding, the archeology. span so we could figure out that roughly this would have been the layout of each regiment. Each one of these would be a regiment uh, with their tents about 15 feet on center. And then have evolved that into a plan that honors any healthy trees that do remain after the drought with clearing so people can use it. It's 90 acres of a memorial landscape. Now, I believe that when we're confronting nature, we have an empathetic relationship to it because it can die every tree that you know will die just as you will. And you have this biological response to living things that we don't have to a granite wall with a thousand names of people we don't know. So we wanted to honor the authentic artifacts. And I'll say authenticity again with Centennial Park. They're modest, they're toilets and shower buildings. And how do we do that? Well, remember the logging history of this site. Remember the productive landscape history of this site. And when I looked at this image of this grove, um, we all started to think, doesn't that look like this is from Camp Logan, the soldiers practicing marching in formation, and then this image of a Japanese forest in the snow. And we thought, what if we replant 15 feet on center, remembering where each of these soldiers lived in the configuration of the original regiments and the forest is a living memorial to all of the soldiers and their sacrifice, but it looks like a cathedral. Your soul soars when you see it. It's a beautiful space to tell this important piece of history that's pretty much forgotten in Houston. 
So this is a rendering of what the memorial groves might look like with the clearings, the remaining healthy trees, and it's 90 acres of loblolly pine forest. Now, loblolly pines meet their useful productive age at 25 years in the Texas ecology. That's the average age of the soldier that died fighting in World War I. The idea is that in 25 years, one of these regiments would be cut down. Chainsaws would come into the park, the entire regiment publicly felled as an act of memorial. So we would cut down hundreds of trees in the public eye. They would be cured, the wood milled, and go to Habitat for Humanity projects to build public housing in the city. The trees, at 25 years, are sacrificed for the common good. And then on Armistice Day, a thousand Houstonians come together to replant the baby saplings that grow again to become the next generation of memorial. So, off to New York. <laughs> In this case, when we were, um, we competed for this project by invitation. Three firms were invited to work for a month to generate ideas for what's called the Hudson Yards. The site is this, this giant hole in Manhattan. This is the High Line coming down around the last leg of the High Line. That's Madison Square Garden with Penn Station squashed underneath it. Um, it was a very funny uh, experience. Suddenly this giant, you know, developer calls us and says, you know, we'd like for you to enter this and we have two other firms competing. When I found out who they were, you know, they're giant firms and we were, our New York office was six people at the time. And um, I said, all right, we'll try. Like, I, I'm not smart enough to be scared, so we'll try. And we started with our process. They said, well, this is going to be really different for you because there's nothing there. I said, there's always something there. <laughs> always. This is a 25-foot deep hole. So the project is to span over these active rail lines that have to keep working during construction and once the project is finished. So this is basically a 28-acre lid over all of these active rail lines. The engineering hubris is daunting and quite frightening and such a weird project for us to be doing. But I thought, well, I'll take the 50 grand, we'll work for a month, we'll have a ball, we'll come up with a lot of great ideas, and ha, that's, that'll be a fun experience. And so we finished our month, and the secretary of Mr. Ross called, and, he, and she said, um, she said, now, will you and your partners be presenting, and how many people? And I was like, oh, I don't have any partners. Um, <laughs> but could I just bring my whole office? And she was like, sir, no, that's very unconventional. I said, well, look, we're tiny. There's no way we'll win this thing. And the only gratification my incredible staff is going to have is if we all get to come to present it to Mr. Ross. And she said, well, how many people are we talking about? And I said, six. <laughs> she was like, okay, you can come. So about a week later, it was 3 a.m., I was in New Zealand on a project, dead asleep. My phone rings, and it was related, saying, you've been selected to be the landscape architect for this project. So here we are for four years down the, down the road. And we've been building for two years, and it's been an incredibly exciting project. Now I'm gonna walk you through some of the ideas and the there's no there there uh, rebuttal. So um, this is what the project will look like. This tower is finished. Our office is right there. Um, so we look at it out the window every day. It's kind of scary. Um, this is about this high right now. So this one is going to be the third largest skyscraper in New York City. There are nine skyscrapers, and it goes all the way from the Hudson River back to here. But what was it in 1609, we ask our first question. <laughs> well, <laughs> disturbingly, the western yards are in the river. Um, that's all fill. The eastern yards are the confluence of, of rivers in a wet meadow. This is probably why this site was never built on until it became a rail yard. This was a long time ago. The current rail yard was built in 1985. 
but this is where we are. This is thanks to Markley Boyer and Eric Sanderson, the authors of the Manhattan Project. What was Manhattan from the 1600s to today? A really exciting project. So just keep watching the Eastern Yards, which is the project I'll talk about, and the Western Yards, which we're in concept design for right now. The Pennsylvania Railroad Company wanted to link Manhattan to the rest of the United States. There was a major obstacle. The Hudson River not only is a mile wide, but it's 450 feet deep of granite gorge that has been filled with glacial till. Remember, you have the harbor coming in and the Hudson coming down. So where the incoming tide meets the river tide, the energy is dissipated and all sediment drops. So it's extremely shallow having filled this gorge. So you basically have goop, very technical term, that you can't put any footings down to carry a tunnel. So you had to, the um, Transcontinental Railroad had been built, this marvel of, civil, of engineering, bringing people from San Francisco to the Jersey Shore, and then 40 million people a year took a steamboat to get to Manhattan. So Pennsylvania Railroad wanted to build a tunnel. And it was Alexander Cassatt who came up with the idea to link, to anchor two ends of the tube into the granite at each end, and then just hang it with many joints, every 30 inches there's a joint to the steel tube through the muck. So it's kind of like an egg, if you, if you could squeeze it on all sides, it doesn't crush. It's sort of that theory. But, um, and then the Suez Canal was, was, was um, touted as the third greatest act of civil engineering the world had ever seen. So this is the map, this is the granite, and you can see the granite's going straight down, granite going straight down, and this is all silt. So right here is a shaftway, and a tower was built. There was a sighting tower. So in Weehawken and in New York, the towers are looking at each other, and every day they're calibrating the Great Head Shield, this puppy, that's pushing 30 inches ahead, and then these hoppers open, and muck is taken out, and in wheelbarrows, humans take it all the way back the half mile up and out. This is the tunnel you use today, by the way. Um, so this is the profile of the tunnel, the two sighting towers here and here at each end. This is an image from the Hagley Museum of Industry. And in the lower right-hand corner, we looked at it and we're like, wait a minute, that's the middle of our site. That's 32nd and 11th Avenue. That is the heart of our project of Hudson Yards. This is really important. This giant innovation of engineering happened right here. And these guys, let me think about it, are building 28 acres of a seven foot thick club sandwich of steel and concrete and trees and soil and sewage and drinking water and high voltage electricity in this giant club sandwich for 28 acres. That feels kind of innovative as well. So we started to think about this place as its history being innovation. So we wanted to mark the spot and we thought people like to get up a little bit and look out. And I love this image of the arm of the Statue of Liberty uh, delivered to Madison Square Park, and you could pay and go up and look out. <laughs> and then the de Young Museum Tower, um, the Orbit in London, not a fan, but you know the idea of getting up and looking out. And so in our competition brief, we proposed an eight-story tall tower that would be a double helix ramp so that someone in a wheelchair could make their way up, and you look at the public on the other side, and it gets narrower and narrower, and by the time you get to the top, you have this lookout all the way around the city, and it's recalling the sighting towers that the engineers used. And then you come down the opposite ramp, so you never intersect any, so thousands of people could make their way up and down. Leonardo da Vinci did it at Chambord. It's, a, it's, well, it's, it's our DNA, actually, but it also kind of looks like a drill. I mean, there are lots of, you know, sort of artful associations. And so this was the idea that it would be sheets of core tin steel mesh that would get more and more transparent as you go up until you have a big lookout at the very top. So they loved the idea, we were hired for the project, and they said, you're not famous. We need somebody who's famous. And so they hired Thomas Heatherwick to make uh, the tower. And so this is what was announced last week. Um, if uh, a few of you sent me emails, thank you very much. Uh, it was very sweet to, to, to know that somebody out there is watching. Um, I don't have parents anymore, so I depend on all of you to be my kind of family. Um, and so here's the plan. Uh, the, uh, remember, this is all on this lid over the trains. So the idea that six million people will come in right here from the High Line, and they'll maybe move toward the Hudson River Parks or Hudson Boulevard Park. And so this idea of this as the mixing bowl of energy of all the people through a parks district of Manhattan in a place that used to be a 25 foot deep, 28 acre hole in the ground. 
So it led to this idea of the dynamism of the human body moving in the kind of what I call the 21st century labyrinth, that you could move and move and move and sort of like the, the um, labyrinth in Chartres Cathedral that was a big inspiration for us. And that to the north, we, we had the depth over the trains that we could lift up with retaining walls and build soil and have big, big trees and really showcase the flora of the Hudson Valley. So all native plants, 220 trees, 60,000 shrubs and perennials in these lush gardens here, and then an outdoor cafe, more terraced gardens, and that then the pavement would be uh, granite blocks, regionally sourced, um, in different mixtures of gray, dark, of black to gray to light gray to white, and that every time an ellipse overlaps with another, they would get more pale. So when you look down on this, you have a kind of dynamism to the ground plane. So this is the high line, and this is where it will enter the project, and that's just showing you how the space sits over the trains. And this is the part we're working on now in concept design. Um, this is the construction site. Uh, this is the throat where all the trains are going down below us. And then this was a real, uh, for, for us, a kind of technical innovation where we lobbied to be the responsible party for coordinating all the engineering. We know we're not engineers, but every time you leave it to the engineer and you have 165 degree hot air and it needs to get out over there, it is a straight line. And I like straight lines too, but when there are 30 trees with their soil in between, you need to reroute that. And so we ended up coordinating all of these layers from these are the tunnels, the caissons, the steel, uh, sorry, the uh, electrical and plumbing infrastructure, the steel framework, the breathing apparatus to let the hot air of the trains out, and then the soil tanks, and then the thing that everybody will think we only did, which is the soil and the trees. <laughs> like, love the bushes you picked for Hudson Yards. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> so, you know, this represents our role, this crazy section. This was for a, an article in the, I think it was the Time, New York Times. So you see the jet propulsion engines, the breathing apparatus, the 60,000, we're still eco-warriors. We fought to have all the rainwater that falls on the site is captured. 60,000 gallon tanks that pump all the water back through the site, uh, the soil beds and fountains, etc. All of this in a seven, average seven foot thick sandwich. There's the sandwich being built. So this has to hold all of it. And this will end up coplanar with 11th Avenue. So you won't even know that you're over the trains. These are some images of the North Garden. Uh, this is a rendering that we had done. This is a 200 foot long fountain that comes from up here. The culture shed is a 130 foot tall rolling building. So watch this. Um, this is over an orchestra or fashion week or some kind of performance. It's on wheels. And this giant 130 foot tall concrete, imagine a 13 story building just rolling around town. It's a pretty great, so check it out. It nests right back, and this is a museum, and it nests right back there when it's good weather. So then you have this open plaza. I mean, it's like the end of the Roman Empire. Sometimes I feel like we, sh we maybe shouldn't be building these things. Um, so this is my first time on a jumbotron, and like I said, since I don't have mom and dad to show it, I'll show you. This is, this, that's, that's little me, and that's big me. With, I told Gary last night, my pores aren't small enough to be on a jumbotron. Um, but that's Anderson Cooper, uh, Mr. Ross, our boss, Thomas Heatherwick saying, hey, wait a minute, I wanted to be on TV. Um, and uh, where we announced the, the vessel. Uh, the, now we can show these for the first time in a couple of years. This is Thomas Heatherwick's uh, work um, that was uh, uh, to get people up in the air in this eight story tall tower. And this is what it looks like coming up the North Gardens. Uh, this is entering from the High Line. Um, this is entering from 11th Avenue into the plaza. You can see the mix of colors in the pavement, the outdoor cafe. This is a 200 foot long bench that here, uh, we designed it so every rib is different as it moves along its slats of wood. So there you're lying back, looking up, and as it moves around, the back is lowering and it's coming up. So like, um, what was her name? Goldilocks. You can find where on the bench you feel good and you and your friends can hang out. I love this guy. He's like, what the heck? It's coming at me. <laughs> it looks like it's rolling toward him. Anyway. Uh, and then this will be... Pretty spectacular, the view looking out up. This is Michael van Valkenburg's beautiful park, uh, Hudson Boulevard Park, the retail podium, and the third tallest skyscraper in New York. So 
Um, we were able to capture New York State ecology, to tell the story of native plants, to talk about the fountain is all about the way streams work, uh, the thalweg, the bottom of it is carved in a way that captures a kind of current, um, telling the rail history, telling all of these stories. So even when we were 25 feet up in the air, we tried to find a way to tell a new story. And this is the, this is the site of a couple weeks ago. So um, it's all happening right there. So let's bring it home. <laughs> home, finally. It feels so good to be home. Um, so the last project I wanted to talk about is our, our I'll say, mutually beloved uh, Centennial Park. Um, this is a, a Google Earth image, and you can already see the results of some of phase one. You can see uh, significantly less green on the top of the lake. Um, you can see the removal of uh, the sort of BVD-shaped uh, parking lot in front of, right out the front door, to this event lawn ellipse, and the beginning of what will become a very large organizing circle all the way around the, this part of the park. Reorganize the parking, bus drop-off, and then a more sustainable stormwater management um, using native plants to clean the soil, clean the water. And then this line of the Natchez Trace, Cockerel Spring, and Musician's Corner. So, how did we start? Um, we were building on the work of uh, Gustafson Guthrie Nickel. They had done a master plan. And in that master plan, one of the early observations was that the period of significance was the, the um, exposition. And we thought, instead of 100 years ago, what if the period of significance was 150 million years ago? <laughs> like, why think small? And we started to realize, uh, you know, that, again, the research that my team was doing was just, it was so exciting to have those design meetings because it was just like all this stuff was coming out about Nashville. And there's this incredible dynamic that basically the middle of the United States is a shallow sea, sediment, salt, layers, millions of years, plates buckle, and you have the Nashville Dome that stretches from Kentucky through Tennessee. That cracks open, it erodes, revealing layers of salt and limestone, and you have what's now called the Nashville Basin with the iconic falls that sh over these layers of stone. So it's like, oh, the way this place was shaped could actually inspire the way we move water, the way we build walls, the materials we use, like the actual way 150 million years ago that this place was in a dynamic, I mean, very slow dynamic, but a dynamic. Um, and these images of the falls, we just love the Duck River Step Falls, um, and uh, yeah, just sort of reading the landscape in a very ancient and deep way. And then this is an opportunity to really understand something that I'm quite passionate about. When the ecology of a place shapes the culture that ensues in a place. So how are we shaped? Why did people come here? You have the Great Salt Lake, bison, Native Americans following them, established hunting routes, colonial settlers putting down wood planks to make plank roads, the network of the roads of Nashville today overlaying on the first colonial maps of the Native American hunting trails is the same. Geolo geology led to animal behavior, which led to human behavior, which led to a copy of human behavior, which led to asphalt, which led to the traffic jam outside. So, <laughs> but there is a continuum between the forces of nature that shape a place and why we come here. Well, one of the great reasons to come here was there was a lot of water. There was a lot of fresh water. This is how the water under Nashville works. You have a water table that is completely fractured through this limestone. It's called karst. And water's moving in all kinds of insane, unpredictable ways. So areas will drain incredibly fast. So you settle in Nashville, you dig a cesspit, you use the cesspit for what God intended, and it goes away. And it's like, this is awesome. Until all your neighbors are doing the same thing, and then you get cholera. Um, so this became a real horror for the city. There were three major outbreaks of cholera in the city, and it led to Nashville being an innovator in technologies for public health. To me, this is fascinating. So this is why Cockerell Spring gets piped away. It gets covered. Lick Branch Creek is piped over with a vaulted brick tunnel 
to prevent the groundwater from commingling and pr to prevent access to it. You know, to us today as ecologists, this is anathema to put a, put a river in a pipe. We just, we're uh, opening rivers now. Then there's also, uh, so here's that hunting trail map, um, the geology section. But then there's also the Native American story of the Mississippian Indians and these incredible mounds and earthworks. So again, all of this is just like, what's the vocabulary of Centennial Park going to be? And all this is the prequel. I mean, this is before we're even thinking about a Centennial Exposition. And then there's the Natchez Trace, or also famously known as the Devil's Backbone, going from Natchez, you know, there's France. Don't forget, that's France. Um, and the workers going down the Cumberland, down the Mississippi, breaking down the barges, and the um, workers walking all the way back to Nashville. So you have workers with a fistful of cash getting off a boat with a long walk ahead. So you have things like inns and food services and prostitutes, and then you very quickly have ministers and <laughs> dealing with the prostitutes. And uh, an entire culture springs up across the Natchez Trace. You have this storied, this storied you know, avenue pouring northeastward into Nashville. Um, letters of those uh, workers revealed interesting comments about they knew that they were in Nashville when they had the fresh, cool waters of Cockrell Spring. So to many, many people, Cockrell Spring said, you're home. We wanted to bring that back. Clearings in the forest along the way were made for these preachers to spread the good word, for people to sing hymns, for people to entertain one another. Simple poles lashed together with a makeshift structure and a slanted roof so that you could hear the gospel or listen to gospel or sing a tune of your own. And we started to think, is perhaps the root of the entertainment industry in Nashville also found deep in the Natchez Trace? And then to the search for Cockrell Spring. Um, it was interesting, I met a guy last night at Best of Nashville and he's like, yeah, my son saw a map in our kitchen and it showed the spring and he's the one who found Cockrell Spring. I was like, awesome, that's great. Like, I, I didn't know his son, but um, I was excited that lots of people have been on this, on this mission. Um, this, it was really a great story. Uh, this is from uh, 1959 with this dude pointing to a uh, uh, the black X, I love old school journalism where you just cut out a big X and you glue it on the picture and run the, run the paper. And so we, we could identify where we were on West End and start to dig around. Um, uh, see, finding the spring in its authentic spot was very, very important. Um, you know, digging down, there's a manhole cover. It was about six feet, it was about six feet deep down below. Um, but this is a map of the cholera epidemic and I think this is very important because if you lose a major percentage of your entire population, you have to do something about it. And so the um, incredible innovation of the 8th Avenue Reservoir, 8th Street Reservoir uh, of 1877, a sand filtration plant, which is absolutely a magnificent structure. This is tremendous innovation in the United States in public health. And then the, uh, the Lick Branch sewer being piped in. Um, another layer of the history of the site is this, this is the West, End, West Side track. So Lake Watauga is right there and that was impounding water so they could build the track all the way around. So when you look at the plan of the Centennial Exposition, you can sort of latently see a giant racetrack under there. And there it is. So this is roughly where the racetrack had been, which I think is very interesting. But then let's mind this a little bit. Let's look really hard at this drawing. You have these, all these grand aspirational buildings. Nashville says, okay, there was a little bit of cholera. Maybe we lost a third of the population, but we're smart and we're open for business. And how do you tell that to the world? You have an exposition. So the first time most people in Tennessee had seen a light bulb, there is an infusion of culture and art and science and industry and agriculture and, and you know, um, public issues of the Negro People's Pavilion, the Women's Pavilion, all of these anchors of the history of the city are placed in this, uh, in this park. So you have this kind of very formal radial geometry that governs much of the park. Of course, the Parthenon with this big loop around the Parthenon. But then you have another language that's much more of the picturesque era with these braided paths that make their way through gardens 
and plantings um, all the way around the park. So we thought, well, maybe that's something we could glean from this, that there are two languages of the structure of the park. Because frankly, when the buildings were demolished and a lot of grass was planted, there haven't been a lot of design efforts made in the park. So this was an opportunity to give the entire park a coherent frame. The women that have shaped this park are absolutely extraordinary. The women's history here was a big story that needed to be amplified dramatically. And we've been able to do that. You know, Ann Cockrell, uh, we think, was the first woman to hold, hold free title west of the Appalachian Mountains. She's the sister of the founder of Nashville, and this was her farm that she successfully farmed, and this is where the Cockrell Spring is that the workers remember so fondly. But we also have the women's building of the exposition, and Dallas Dudley, and the march from the Capitol to the doors of the Parthenon, the symbol of democracy for the world, to march that women should be given the right to vote. It's hard to believe it was ever a question. Um, and this remarkable letter from Feb Byrne, who wrote to her 22-year-old son, who's in the House of Representatives, said, you must change your vote so that women can have, in the legislature, so that women can have the right to vote. He did. I think he read her letter on the floor of the House, and Tennessee was the deciding vote in uh, women's suffrage. So there's this arc of stories that I won't go into, but you know, that the Japanese garden was renamed the Sunken Garden in World War II because of the, um, the hate for the Japanese nation. And uh, you have the civil rights, uh, the huge civil rights movement. And we're, we need to tell these stories. We need to amplify these stories um, into the park. So I'm gonna end with just uh, showing you some of the drawings of the park and where we are right now, um, telling more of the Civil War history at Flagpole Hill, the Shakespeare Theater here, uh, Performing Arts Center here, and then using our read of the major geometries from the exposition grounds, not to recreate them, we're not trying to rebuild the exposition, but to have something that resonates with the bones that are in the ground, the stories that are in the ground. So this is that more uh, braided, uh, picturesque era language, and then the big geometries surrounding the Parthenon and the Great Lawn. And this is the master plan. So they're pretty subtly buried in there, but I wanted to raise those bones so that you see them. And now as you find your way, West End, Cockrell Spring, Musician's Corner, we're proposing these two 300 foot long alleys of oaks, hickories, tulip poplars, mixed native trees of Tennessee, rebuilding the great lawn as a high performance lawn that can rebound so it's not a, a, so muddy after a play. And there's a lot of love given to that lawn. And it, and to give it more of a chance by re-engineering its soils. Um, removal of the parking here, this piece is done with the oval. Um, we had imagined this is, was a placeholder during the planning process. Could that become a gallery or ticketing for the Parthenon? You know, it's really hard to add on to a temple. I want you all to go home and try. <laughs> try to build an addition to a temple. It's tricky. Um, and so could that become a gallery space or ticket space or gift shop or pavilion? Like, what could that be? Um, redoing the walks around the lake, redoing the lake's edge, making this a, a, a good dining facility while remembering the civil rights, uh, closing of the pool by rebuilding that terrace, exactly the shape of the pool, telling that story. Um, Shakespeare Pavilion, a wedding lawn where the current shed is, lots of stuff going on. This is something from the Gustafson master plan that we wanted to retain, this idea of the axial uh, reflecting pool to the Parthenon. And then also, she had a terrific idea, which I loved, that was called the contemporary picturesque, like really building on the picturesque movement through lush horticulture of mix of grasses and native perennials and native plants. So we've really held on to that. This was phase one. Um, these are the results of phase one. Instead of a parking lot, you now have the events lawn. The event last night, being in the tent and looking out from under the tent to the facade of the Parthenon was splendid, absolutely splendid. And you're seeing the grasses here starting to finally take root. The hair transplant is behind us. Um, I'm sorry for the year and a half of mulch, but those puppies put down 12 feet of roots. Uh, so they are very, very strong and resilient plants, but it takes them a while because they're, they're working on their roots and not their hair um, for a long time. Uh, cleaning up the water, these floating islands have uh, long roots that are absorbing nutrients. 
Um, the bioswale, that you'll notice there are no curbs. They, the water drops into this, is treated here, and then it goes into a, a big rain garden that cleans it before it goes into Lake Watauga, again, removing nutrients. And then this was an idea, we're not finished here, this will become grasses as well, but an idea that, uh, I lived in Italy for five years and I would go to visit all the Greek ruins I could find in Sicily and Southern Italy. And I was able to find this picture of Selenunte and the, in the meadow where it appears and thinking like, okay, this is a kind of contextual echo of the, the ancientness of this building. There's something about seeing car bumpers and a mown lawn in a temple that was like, something's not quite, so that was inspiration for the grasses around. And then uh, Musician's Corner, uh, very much inspired by that engraving, I'll show you again, of the camp meetings. Um, there's a little bit of a natural bowl here, and then Cockerel Spring, and this diagonal line of stones was intended to represent the Natchez Trace, the devil's backbone um, in that s series of stories. So here is the front end of the park. Thank you to the folks at the um, Holiday Inn who let us go up and take pictures off the balcony. Um, but you can see the access lane to Musician's Corner and Cockrell Spring and the beginning of a rill that in some future phase will continue through these woods um, in this kind of bucolic setting of forest. So zooming in, hopefully you've all been there. If you haven't, shame on you. But thank you for still coming to the talk. Um, this is... Talk about authenticity, this is actually the lid that was down underground that was exhumed and brought back up. And we were intent to not make a babbling brook, like a fake creek in the park of something that had been completely destroyed and was being brought back. So we thought this artifact allows us to interpret it, the spring water to come up and then make its way down this constructed channel and then spread out and have access to these wetland plants. So again, bringing as much biodiversity to the park as possible. And um, I love this as a children's garden. There's nothing, like if anybody looked at that, they'd be like, well, ah, kids aren't gonna like that. Kids need bright colors and swings and all this. And I was like, well, actually, um, one parent told me, she said, my kid's scooter fits perfectly in that channel. <laughs> And the kid like rides the scooter down the channel. She's like, is that okay? I was like, I love that you do that. I think that might not be appreciated by everybody, but I love it. Um, and just showcasing the beauty of the geology of this place. Where are we? We know where we are. We are in Nashville. Um, so looking out uh, and then the rill coming down and ribbing it so it has different effects as it moves down the way starting to see the plantings grow in. You know, bear with us, these plantings take a couple of years to establish. They're not annuals. They don't show a bright, satisfying display in a week. It takes years, and I'm sorry for that, but I think the investment is worth it. Uh, and here's where the water spills out into the treatment wetlands. And then just quietly cutting in the word Natchez with the view to the, park, to the Parthenon, and then at the other end, Nashville. It's a little subtle moment. I wish the TV series would pick up on that. <laughs> and then make a major donation to the Conservancy. <laughs> um, and here you have the Musician's Corner Amphitheater and then these intentionally constructed mounds. You know, budget and, well, budget but also design. We didn't want to build enough seating for 3,000 people and then it looks empty. It looks like an amphitheater that's empty all the time. So how can you accommodate a lot of people or an intimate group, have it look beautiful if it's empty? And I love seeing people having lunch there. Like it's. It's really being used, well, except for t that day, sorry. <laughs> um, but then these mounds are an homage to the Mississippian mound building. So people can sit up on the mound, spread their picnic blankets, get a nice view, and it doesn't look like a large, empty amphitheater. So here are people enjoying it, and there's our inspiration, the camp meetings. Um, it's not too different. And there are uh, folks enjoying the, and the seating. And then at night, it has a wonderful quality. You can see these are the mounds um, that people can occupy to enjoy the amphitheater. And uh, last little bit, I'm gonna just show you the lighting is something that lots of people have asked me about because I think folks are getting excited about it. We brought Linnea Tillett from New York um, uh, to uh, do her magic. Um, I always call her a, 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 a light poet. Um, so the, the beautiful doors uh, of the Parthenon and she said her idea was to allow, as the sun goes down and night falls, to allow the Parthenon to wake up. So over the course of an hour plus, it's an event. 
and it starts with just light on the door. And watch, the moon is going to move with us to show you the time. So washing the bronze door with light, and then the sides of the columns, the naus, the sculpture at the top, and finally the acterion. And so it's completely awake for the night. And then at dawn, it can start to go back to sleep uh, for the next day. In closing, I just want to let you know we are in phase 2A. The scope of that is a new entry on West End, the lawn, the alleys, um, renovation of this area for events, a pavilion, and all the surroundings of Lake Watauga. When you add that to phase um, 2, it really equals the heart of the park. And this, these are on the boards right now. These are concepts of new entry uh, markers at West End. Um, uh, from the western alley, what this would look like with these giant trees and people playing and limestone uh, seating. Uh, the plan of the alleys, keeping all the old trees that are there, but as they, as they die, not replanting them there, but allowing these to become the two and three hundred year old trees. And you can see benches and seating. This is literally carefully designed to accommodate all the traffic for the craft fair. Um, with roads that trucks can come in, vans can come in, drive along here, offload, and drive back out so that they're not crisscrossing the lawn anymore. This is an image of a new wall and entry to the alley, the sports fields and the alley to the west. Um, the suffragist memorial, where we're looking at bringing the statue right to the ground so that we, um, again, amplify their story by placing the suffragist memorial in the middle of this 300 foot long walk. So you see them in the distance. And the, the work of the suffragist movement is not done. We all face it every day. We all see sexism in the workplace and in our nation and even in our politics. And we can walk with these strong women. Um, by bringing them to the ground and bringing them into the middle of the walkway, you can walk, a, a, a walk in amongst them and kind of join the march uh, for suffragists. This was, you know, we have wanted to edit some of the plop and drop of this park over the years. And when we got a call that the monument had been refused from the state grounds, um, we were like, we would love to have it because it's an authentic story that belongs to Centennial Park. And we want to tell that story. This object belongs here. Um, so it's been a real honor to work with uh, these women that have, that have fought a long time for this to happen. It's in a temporary location, but it's going to be in the East LA. And then replanting, uh, showcasing the native flora of, um, of Tennessee. And uh, so recapping there, uh, phase one plus phase two equals that much of the park will be renovated when we finish the campaign. It was announced my last trip, I was here about a month ago, and uh, Megan Berry announced on a um, press conference that they're at around 22 million of the 30 million for, uh, that's uh, the bulk of the next phase. So that would be the results when we finish, uh, finish the work at hand. And that's the full uh, master plan. So in closing, I just uh, want to remind you what an honor it has been, how much we have enjoyed this experience and the people that we've gotten to know and this magical, magical place. And I appreciate the trust from donors who are believing in this mission, from the, uh, the parks, the maintenance, uh, the leadership at parks, um, Tara, uh, Hudson Douglas. It's been an incredible collaboration of many, many people. And together, we hope to be good stewards of the next pages of the family album of Nashville, Tennessee. Thank you. Thank you.